Shabbat Shalom. It was March 17th, 1922. It was a Friday night. And as Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, a blessed memory, ta tucked his daughter Judith into bed at night on that Shabbat, he looked into her eyes and he whispered to her, tomorrow morning, you're going to become bat mitzvah. Judith Kaplan looked up at her father and said, what? What is a bat mitzvah? And sure enough, on Shabbat morning, March 18th, 1922, Judith Kaplan became the first female in America to become bat mitzvah, to celebrate becoming bat mitzvah. We mark this Shabbat 100 years of women becoming bat mitzvah. Judith Kaplan Eisenstein went on to become a PhD, a Jewish educator specializing in music. And that Shabbat, March 18th, 1922, when Judith read out of the Chumash at the end of the Torah service at her father's synagogue, she became the first bat mitzvah in America. It wasn't until 70 years later, in 1992, that Judith, then at the age of 82, read from the Torah scroll as she celebrated another bat mitzvah. But of course, what we well know is that Judith Kaplan, Judith Kaplan Eisenstein, started a revolution in America she opened a path by which women may finally attain full rights in our synagogues across this country of ours. A hundred years of girls, women, becoming bat mitzvah. As part of my rabbinical school training, as part of my thesis writing, I researched the halacha of conservative Judaism. And one of the areas that I wanted to focus in was how halakha, how Jewish law changes. And so, of course, I researched the Jewish law as it pertains to women in the synagogue service. And though the conservative rabbis over the course of 50 years tried this way and tried that way to justify women be, uh, being counted as part of the minion, women reading Torah, they couldn't do it there really is no justification within halakha for women's full participation in the service. So you know what finally they decided? It doesn't matter. It's just the right thing to do. It doesn't matter. It's just the right thing to do. I was thinking about that as I came to our haftarah for this morning. And I'll invite you to join with me uh, in your Eitz Chaim Chumashim on Mom, page 629. Page 629 in the Eitz Chaim Chumash. And here Jeremiah has spent much of his lecturing to the Jewish people, saying, you're doing it wrong. I understand you're worried about sacrifices. I understand that sacrifices are prescribed in the book of Exodus, in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy. I get it, Jeremiah says, but you're missing the point. You're missing the point, Jeremiah says. And so here at the end of our Haftarah, in the ninth chapter of the book of Jeremiah, we read, Ko Amar Hashem, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the strong man glory in his strength, let not the rich man glory in his riches. God says, this is not what is important to me, who is wise and who is strong, who is wealthy. But only in this should one glory, God tells us through Jeremiah. Haskel v'yodoa, let me try that again. Haskel v'yodoa oti. The translation I find a little weak here. It says, in his earnest devotion to me is what one should glory. But if we look at the Hebrew, I think a better translation Haskel v'yadoa oti. What should one glory in? Truly trying to know and understand God. Truly.
truly trying to know and understand God. And earlier in the Haftarah, Jeremiah actually says, what do I want from you, Jews? I want you to walk in my path. I want you to do as I do, God says to us. I know you Jews are concerned with every little detail of law. I know you Jews are concerned with which shoe you tie first. I know you Jews are concerned with whether this is milchik or fleshig or parif. But when you spend too much time focusing on that, you're missing the point. And so what does God then say to us? What does it mean to know God? What does it mean to understand God? What does it mean to walk in God's ways? For I, the Lord, act with kindness, justice, and equity in the world. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. What does God want from us? Chesed, mishpat, utzdaka. Chesed, kindness, mishpat, justice. Tzedakah here translated as equity. I might stick with what we know in our kishkas is tzedakah, which is charity, giving kindly to others who are in need. That's what God wants. And so while we're caught up in all the other details of Jewish law, which matter, don't forget what's really important at the end of the day. We are now in a period of the Jewish calendar that I might argue is the most important period on the Jewish calendar. We are at a time of the calendar that I might suggest is even more important than the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Because while those days are important, and I'm not looking to undermine the importance of those days, what we do from Purim to Passover is really what it's all about. And I think it's fascinating that this window of time coincides with 100 years of women celebrating becoming bat mitzvah. What do Purim and Passover have in common? Let's first talk about tzedakah, as the haftar, as Jeremiah references. We know that one of the central mitzvot of celebrating Purim is matanot le'evyonim, of giving gifts to the poor. We know that one of the central mitzvot of Pesach is ma'ot chitin, of making sure even the poor among Israel have the opportunity to celebrate Passover properly. This is the window in which tzedakah is truly important. We're obligated to give to the poor. But not just tzedakah mishpat, justice. What does it mean at this time of the year to focus on justice? I think there's an interesting parallel between Purim and Passover in that the great feasts of Passover and the great feast of Purim are preceded by fasts. First you fast, then you celebrate. We have the fast of Esther, and then we have the great celebration that is Purim. We have the fast of the firstborn, and then we have the great celebration which is Passover, and especially the Seders on Seder night. What is this juxtaposition between fasting and feasting? The idea that even in our joy, even in our celebration, when we are empowered, we Jews have to temper our power to remember those who have less power. This is one of the central themes of Judaism. This is one of the central messages of Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. This is our Jewish reaction to the world's greatest empires of Egypt and Persia. It's for us Jews to remember that when we have power, we have to uplift and care for those who have less power. We have to remember what it means to be slaves in Egypt. We have to remember what it means to be oppressed by Haman. And so we temper our feasts by fasting the day before. We remember to care for those who are lacking in power. And we remember that we're not allowed to oppress them. So in this particular window between Purim and Passover, we talk about justice. In this window between Purim and Passover, we talk about charity. And in this window between Purim and Passover, we talk about chesed, kindness. I don't think it's a coincidence that the great hero of the Purim story is 
Who's the great hero of the Purim story? Esther, a woman, as Marjorie points out for us. And who's the great hero of the Passover story? A little trickier of a question. Miriam, someone suggested. Is Miriam the great hero of the Passover story? Some might say it's Moshe. I might say they're wrong. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses is not the great hero of the Passover story. Moses is the reluctant leader who God selects, and God says, you go, even though you don't want to. Who are the heroes of the Passover story? Shifra and Pua, who our rabbis tell us as Yocheved, Moses' mom, and Miriam, Moses' sister, who when Pharaoh said, kill all of the Israelite boys being born, they said, no, we're not going to do it. Not because God told them not to do it, but because they knew in their heart what was good and what was right. They knew in their heart at the end of the day that chesed, that kindness, had to prevail. The heroes of the Passover story are Yocheved and Miriam. The heroes of the Passover story are the women who kept the Jewish home strong over 400 years of slavery. And so it is that our rabbis teach on account of Jewish women were the Jewish people redeemed. On account of Jewish women were the Jewish people redeemed. Purim and Passover are about justice. Purim and Passover are about tzedakah. They're about charitable giving. And Purim and Passover are about the kindness that is best taught to us by Jewish women and by women of all kinds. Because women care for these little infant babies, what we might call unwarranted love. These little babies that just scream all night long. These little babies that need a whole lot of love and care. And these women teach us how to care for these children, even when we don't necessarily want to so much. That's the kind of unwarranted kindness that we're supposed to show to all those in need. That's the kind of unwarranted kindness that we hope God shows toward us, the Jewish people. In this window between Purim and Passover, remember at the end of the day, what is it that God wants? God wants chesed, kindness. God wants mishpat, justice. And God wants tzedakah, charitable giving to those who are in need. Now, lest you think the women get away that easily and I'm just going to celebrate them all morning long, let me push back a little bit. Because what we come to see from our tradition is that sometimes you have to elevate to the 30,000-foot level and just say, what's really most important? That's what Jeremiah did. Kindness, justice, charity. But we don't entirely abrogate the system to just focus on what's important. We Jews know that you have to focus on the details, too. You don't just look at the forest. The trees matter also. So on this Shabbat, in which we celebrate 100 years of women becoming bat mitzvah, let me ask, women receive now full rights in our congregation and our community, but are women taking on full obligation as well. And let me just raise the question. If women want full rights, which I think they deserve, shouldn't we also see more women wearing taluses? Shouldn't we also see more women wrapping tefillin? Shouldn't we see more women seeking to chant Torah? More women seeking to chant Haftarah like Sue did beautifully this morning? And isn't part of that honor of receiving the rights also saying, how can I fulfill even more obligations? And I want to just leave that with you to consider and think about. I'm not making any official decrees about what Shahar Tzedek will be doing. But as we know, with great privilege comes great responsibility. How do we as men, how do we as women, seek to celebrate our privilege by living lives of profound obligation. 
So I'd like now on this Shabbat in which we celebrate women, on this Shabbat on which we focus on what's most important in Judaism, kindness, justice, charity, I'd like to invite everyone to please rise. As I offer now a special prayer for the women in our congregation and for all of us. May the one who blessed our ancestors, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, bless Congregation Charitzedek, and especially its women and girls, as we mark today the 100th anniversary of that first bat mitzvah that took place on March 18th, 1922. After Judith Kaplan rose as the first bat mitzvah, girls and women across North America organized for greater participation in all areas of Jewish life. We celebrate all those pioneers in our synagogue, the vast majority of them members of our synagogue sisterhood, who came forward like our ancestors Miriam and Yocheved to lead our community. Standing on the shoulders of giants, we single out for honor today Marjorie Salson for her decades of sacred leadership to achieve full and equal rights in our synagogue for women. Among so many other accomplishments, in 1981, Marjorie organized the first sisterhood Shabbat. In 1983, she organized the first adult women to become Benot Mitzvah. And in 1989, she became the first adult woman to read Torah from Arbima. We celebrate today Francine Hermelin, who in 1982 became the first Shabbat morning Bat Mitzvah at Congregation Shar Tzedek, and to my knowledge, the first female to chant Torah in our congregation. We give thanks today for Dottie Wagner, who in 1998 became the synagogue's first female president and paved the way for Mary Knoll, Jerry Fishman, and Susan Kozik Klein, three of our last four presidents. It was in that same year that Dottie became president, 1998, nearly 20 years after the synagogue's first bat mitzvah, that women gained the opportunity to participate fully in our synagogue prayer services. These women whom we name today, and so many others throughout the last century, physically and spiritually unrolled the holy scroll of Torah in this congregation, so that all may feel God's presence through its teachings, and so that all might pursue the life of kindness, justice, and charity that God intended of us through the Torah's commandments. To the women of our congregation yesterday and today, we honor your leadership, vision, and commitment. May you be kept and held in blessing. May you be remembered for opening fully the path of Judaism to all its adherents. May you continue to see the fruits of your labor in the blossoming of our community. And may you be granted health and kept from all harm, along with all the people Israel and the world. And let us say together, Amen. And thank you. I invite you now to.